All right, I'm gonna give it a few minutes, let everybody join. It looks like we lost Mark. In the meantime, though, I am going to test out my new music bot and play us a song while we wait. Sambil ngotor, sambil ngotor, sambil ngakonin berdaro. Oleh Yani, manusia yang di dalam itu pupilnya lo genikan. Oke, it looks like our song request was not the right song, so... It was slightly creepy. I apologize. In the meantime, though, it, it, I feel like, Mark, we're having issues. I can't hear you still, and you're trying to talk to me, aren't you? Let's get that sorted first. Nothing. All right, he's gonna drop. Okay, you know what, in the meantime, um, I actually wanted to speak with the community and the DAO a little bit because since announcing Carbon, there was a lot of confusion or at least some confusion in the, like within the DAO and the community about branding and, and the BNT token and the deficit. And I don't know if anybody has noticed or has seen what I posted on Discourse recently, but I was addressing the DAO and the Bancor community regarding these things and my own personal opinion and my own, you know, my hope for the role that Carbon can play in the recovery of the V2.1 and V3 reserves. If you haven't read it yet, but would like to, I just shared it in the general chat under V2.1 and V3. Um, I would love, you know, feedback on it. It really just is more of a personal message on, you know, my my view on this and my hopes for this. So wanted to put that out there. We also went ahead and um, just shared a medium that was just published to the Carbon account. And it is a highlights, like the top takeaways from last week's Twitter spaces. There were quite a few questions that were submitted by the community members and by the DAO that Mark was kind enough to go ahead and answer for us. So went through that, did timestamps and everything else. So they would be really easy to reference. If you weren't able to make the Twitter spaces last week and you at least have, you know, five minutes to read through these highlights, I would definitely recommend that as well. Let's give Mark a few more minutes and see if he's able to join us. Otherwise I'm not quite sure how a Q&A without Mark would go. Let's see. Okay, well, he sent me a message and said that he's updating Discord. So if everybody could just be patient and give us a few minutes. I see him here as a, a guest. Okay, Mark, unmute yourself. Let's test this. Hello, hello. We hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. There's something uh, wrong with the desktop app. So I'm joining from my phone. No, that's okay. Um, Thanks for updating that and for doing all of that. I'm glad that you were able to make it. Um, thanks, everybody, and sorry about that. I appreciate your patience and, you know, you joining the call today. 
So first time we're actually able to get together, you know, as the DAO and the community and actually speak about carbon. So I'm actually really excited about this. It always feels so much more personal when we're able to engage on a, you know, a platform like this. The only thing I ask, I give you have questions, I already see a hand up, so I'll go ahead and bring you up. I just ask that it's, you know, it remains carbon focused and that we all remain respectful of each other. And um, yeah, I'm going to mark, unless you have anything, I'm just going to jump right in and let our first request join us on stage. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Jen, you muted yourself? Yeah, no, I was just inviting our, let's see, I sent them an invite to speak. I see their hand up, so hopefully they'll go ahead and join us. Sure. Otherwise, in the meantime, what we can do is there were a few questions that were submitted to me. Hopefully our community member is able to join us. I've sent you an invite and your hand is up, so you should be able to join. Um, but there were a couple of questions that I saw in the channels that we didn't speak to so much on the Twitter spaces. And like I had said, when you were having issues, we were waiting for you that we had done a key takeaways from the Twitter spaces last week. Um, for anybody who wasn't able to join that, I thought maybe we could just do a little recap of that as well and just make sure that everybody is really kind of grasping these things and that we're providing the clarity on what carbon actually is before, you know, we get too far ahead of ourselves. Somebody in um, our Telegram channel wrote yesterday, and it's a little bit long, so bear with me, right? I don't want to leave anything out, though. Um, something I'm curious about is how carbon is programmed to buy or sell when prices range, when price ranges have been input. In the blog post, the example has a selling range of ETH between 2000 and 2200? Is it simply a case of carbon being programmed to sell 0.5% of the total ETH per $1 price increment, or say 1% of the ETH per $1 price increment if it were a 2000 to $2100 range? Or is it based on X number of cells per X number of blocks? Or does the mechanism of selling throughout a range work in some other way? I know that was a lot. So if you want to break it down, or I can break it down and repeat the, you know, this in little sections, I can do that. No, that's fine. I think I got it. Um, and it's a reasonable question because we never um, we never addressed the specific mechanism for how this occurs. Um, but it sounds like uh, whoever wrote this question um, is convinced that the the protocol will like I don't know use some other exchange to sell those tokens at those price, right? That 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 seems to be the behavior that they're expecting. Um, and it's you know that's that's not at all what happens. Um, it, you can think of it as being like an eBay posting in a way um, where you, you know, rather than rather than setting your, um, your, your product, whatever it is that you're hoping to sell to someone else um, at a price that's prescribed to you by eBay, you can just set whatever price that you want. Um, a, an example that I used earlier today when I was educating someone about the mechanics of carbon. I raised um, a really interesting anecdote. Um, a friend of mine at the beginning of COVID bought like 20 PlayStation 5s. And, uh, you know, the idea was that he was expecting that demand for, um, you know, home console entertainment to spike during COVID. And of course he was right. And uh, what he did was he, he bought them all for some price and um, started listing them on eBay, um, but at different price ranges. <laughs> So, you know, the, the first one would sell for, I don't know, whatever a PlayStation 5 is worth, $2,000 or something like that. And then um, after that, the, the next listing was 2100 and then 2200 2300 and so on until all 20 PlayStations were listed. And, you know, it's uh, anyone searching for a PlayStation 5 can take any one of those orders, right? You can think of each one of those PlayStation 5 listings on eBay as being a specific order where he is expecting you know, uh, a certain amount of money from whoever is, is purchasing the item from him, and they are expecting a PlayStation to be sent to them. And it's, it's really that simple. And so Carbon is, is kind of like a, uh, an eBay alternative for fungible tokens. You can choose to list your tokens at whatever price you are expecting to sell them for. Now, it's not the case 
that um, eBay waits for the price of a PlayStation get to 2,500 before selling it. Someone has to come in and agree to pay 2,500 for a PlayStation. And that is exactly the mechanism that's used here. Your order, when you set it, is visible for everyone who is on the blockchain to interact with whenever they feel like interacting with it. And so when you're setting a price range, um, it has the same kind of hyperbolic behavior um, that we're already familiar with. And so if you're, uh, like what the blog post said, right, selling between um, 2,100 and 2,200 or or whatever the example was, I can't remember it exactly right now, um, it will sell at every single price between um, those those ranges um, until it has sold everything. and in a way, this is precisely the, the type of behavior you would expect out of a concentrated liquidity curve. Now, if you want to, um, if you want to work out um, what the average price is that you had sold all of your tokens for if your order is uh, executed to, um, to completion, right? So if your order is completely fulfilled, then there is a way to do that. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, speak to anyone um, who wants to do to get into this kind of um, analysis, um, the, the, the equations are relatively straightforward. Um, but it's not the case that it sells like um, 5% in, um, in small increments 20 times. That's not how it happens. It's continuous pricing the same way that AMMs continuously price anything. Um, but it's still that same idea. It's just into an infinite number of, of, um, of small increments so that you get com- you know, complete price continuity. Um, and I think that, yeah, just to reiterate, it's not the case that the protocol goes and sells the tokens that you've nominated, right? It, it's, not, um, it's not set up that way. Rather, um, it is advertising the, the price that you have chosen, right? And in a way, it becomes sort of a request for quote protocol um and so you people who are really shopping. Yeah. i don't want to cut you. well i'm going to, i don't want to say i'm not i don't mean to because i'm trying to but really quickly that you're kind of jumping into another question that i had and it's that you had kind of addressed it and so maybe i can stop you before you get too far and you can just take notice of this is something that was on a community member a down member's mind a question in the channel yesterday or you know a couple of days ago was is the amm buying and selling So before you get too far, you had said, it's not like the protocol is doing this. So maybe when you're, you continue speaking, just keep that in mind too, that this is something that, you know, has been raised by a community member. Yeah, I remember seeing that. And um, I think it it got a, the the question is kind of ambiguous and it probably therefore got an ambiguous response. So there's no right answer to that, right? Does the AMM buy and sell it? I prefer to think of it as users themselves are doing the buying and selling, right? It's kind of like asking, um, you know, take my my friend's case when he's selling the PlayStations. Did he sell the PlayStation or did eBay sell the PlayStation? And I guess that that is a, um, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a deep philosophical question. Um, but in, in my sell. view, <laughs> yeah, in my it view, he sense. sold it. Yeah, you know, the people people sold the PlayStation and bought the PlayStation. Um, eBay is just the site that hosted that transaction. Um, and that's precisely how Carbon operates. I got you. So you said that, um, you know, these are visible to everybody, which leads me to another question. Like, how publicly available is all of this? Because someone's asking, are the strategies on Carbon publicly available? Yes, Can somebody absolutely. Tailor- Okay, so can somebody tailor their strategy to be one way lower or higher than an existing strategy to ensure theirs is hurt, is hit first? They, they, I mean, potentially they could, and I guess that that's a type of um, you could consider that a uh, a type of uh, upside down front running, I guess, like because it's makers front running each other rather than takers. Um, but yeah, you if you saw someone you know selling a PlayStation for two thousand, and you were like, huh. I can do a better price than that. I'm going to sell mine for 1900. Both of those listings would appear on eBay, right? And so if someone's shopping around for a PlayStation 5 and they see the $1900 one versus the $2000 one, of course they're going to take the $1900 one first. But this is just a, a characteristic of open markets. So uh, it's neither a uh, you know, it's neither a bug nor a feature. It's just, you know, um the the competition of trading and um how um 
how markets behave normally. So it's yeah, it 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 is what it is. It's um if you have a good or um, an asset that you're trying to sell to someone else, then of course um you know creating competitive pricing to make sure that um consumers are interacting with you more than your competitors is is natural. So I fully expect that to be something that happens. But if you want to dig your heels in and say, no, I refuse to sell um, anything below this this particular price, then that's totally fine. Um, and that's exactly how um, order books um, tend to work anyway. So it's, um, yeah, it is open. You can see every single strategy and every single order all the time. Um, and, you know, it, it is an order book in that, um, you know, in that respect. Got you. I see a couple of people in the audience like that are here that ask me where to submit their questions. So I just want to encourage you again, like if you have questions, I haven't had any submitted to me personally, like just before the call, but I did notice some comments. So if you have questions, just put your hand up and join us. Otherwise, Mark, maybe we can do a recap in the meantime of some of the questions that were asked on the Twitter spaces for anybody who wasn't able to join that. Um, yeah, as you wish. Thanks. The first, you know, we had kind of started it with a little bit of the background, you know, like where where this all kind of came from. And what you had stated was that Carbon aims to bring capabilities of a centralized exchange to a decentralized exchange, plus something more. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on what those capabilities are and that that's something more that carbon brings to the table. Yeah, sure. Um, and so I think um, the context for that was that I was saying that I think that the industry overall um, has kind of been salivating about the idea of a, a decentralized order book for a long time. And there have been a couple of protocols that have come sort of close to that. Um, obviously, Ether Delta back in the day was was definitely an an, an order book based exchange, but you know it had some um, both both legal and um, execution issues. Um, we've heard Uniswap v3 and Trader Joe and others um, kind of talk about their protocols as being um, you know order book like, um, which is certainly true. Like I'm not disagreeing with that. We've also seen um, you know trading bots, which will um, you know happily accept instructions from you and trade against um trade against uh, open liquidity um on any exchange that's happy to accept that uh, that transaction to execute at a certain price and so in that sense um taker uh, limit orders have been a thing for a long time and we know that there are um, fairly successful protocols built around that concept things like rook keeper dow and um keeper by uh, you know which is one of andre Cronier's projects um and so these are, you know, th this has been around for a while. And I think one of the reasons why it hasn't been overly, um, you know, I don't want to say it hasn't been successful. It clearly has. And Uniswap, you know, I think is a huge success, despite it not really being a, an actual order book system. It's just order book like. Um, and so one of the things that I was, you know, stressing about when I was trying to, you know, design a, a, a new product was that, if we were to come up with, you know, uh, an, an order book implementation and actually create real on-chain, you know, market maker liquidity for, for limit orders, um, even though that would be really exciting, I don't think it's enough. You know, one of the things that I've been openly critical of is this idea that, you know, centralized limit, limit order books that are coming on chain um, are actually addressing anything at all. Because, you know, if, if the only thing that you're doing is things that are done off chain on chain, then like, why do we even need blockchains? You know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a weird identity conflict that I think that the industry is, has gone through where everyone is just recreating, you know, the, the normal world of finance on, on blockchains and not really trying to use or harness um, the, um, the advantages that a blockchain can give you. And so one of the things that, um, that I, I really wanted to do was not just create a limit order book, um, because we already have those and they work perfectly well in the centralized contexts. So there's really no value, I think, in just copying that idea, right? You want to bring something else, something new, something that does stuff that you can't do elsewhere and this is you know in, in a way is the, the the definition right it's the philosophy of of innovation 
and if you're not constantly innovating, then it's, you know, it's, um, you know, it, things get stale very quickly. So this extra stuff, right? We, I've, it's certainly an order book, right? There, there's no, um, there, there's no debate around that, but it's what the order book does in this case. That's unusual. When you set up a limit order in a traditional context, um, you just set a single price. And so this means that as, you know, um, as the market is exploring and, you know, realizing the, the price of an asset, if it happens to, um, you know, to reach the price that you have requested, then, you know, someone is going to take you at that price and you will get the, um, you know, the, the, the transaction that you requested, which is great. But after that, there's kind of these, you know, there's a lot of these extra steps. It's almost like the limit order book in those contexts is set up just to execute at a single price. And that's it. Like that's the, the, the very last thing. It's the entire embodiment of what that uh, user had hoped to achieve. But even just a cursory review of the kinds of stuff that the professional traders are talking about on Twitter or on their YouTube channels or with their followers and so on, you know that they're not just setting one limit order and calling it a day, right? They set up dozens of these things at different ranges because they have no idea which way or how far the market will move. And so in order to create these strategies, right, which is the word that that community and that, you know, um, that culture has, has defined for themselves, um, those strategies that they create, the order books that they're using weren't really developed with that type of behavior in mind. Rather, the order book is just there, right? A centuries old idea. And the sophisticated strategies that are built on top of it is really trying to get a machine to do something it wasn't really designed to do. And so Carbon is an order book with, that was designed to allow that type of behavior. So rather than have to set many, many limit orders one after the other at different price ranges, instead, you can just set the price range that you want to execute your strategy over. The other important thing is that um, after a limit order is fulfilled, or is, even if it's partially fulfilled, the, um, you know, the, the fruits of that sale in a conventional context would just be like returned to the user's account, right? Whatever that happens to be. If you're on Coinbase, it will just kind of get returned to your Coinbase wallet or whatever. And then if you want to use those funds that you've just received to, you know, um, to buy something else um, when the price recapitulates, and this is common of people that are channel trading or range trading, then you need to wait for that limit order to be filled wait for the funds to appear in your account, and then use those funds to go and set up another limit order in the reverse direction. And even though they have a completely premeditated um, and carefully executed strategy in mind, they still have this kind of clunky experience where they are waiting right, for this stuff to happen. And they can set up notifications on, on their phone or on their web browser or whatever it happens to be, but they're still waiting for the exchange to tell them Okay, you now have our permission to use the funds that you've you've got to to set up your limit order in the in the opposite direction, and this is kind of a um, a fundamental um, problem, right? This I, I don't think that this is easily a feature that the exchange could build on top of their existing infrastructure because of the way that these things are pieced together. Whereas on Carbon, you can actually come into the protocol with exactly that type of you know mentality that premeditated strategy where you have conviction about which way the markets are headed and that you have a very well, you know, defined uh, risk profile that you're happy to tolerate and you've just defined your price ranges. And after um, tokens are being sold for another token, that that token then immediately funds the, you know, the, um, the reverse trade at a different price point. And this is exactly how professional traders make, you know, a living um, is out of these types of strategies. And so to give them a tool that is actually purpose built to, um, to facilitate exactly that type of behavior, I think is something to be really excited about. Um, and that's when, you're, when I'm saying that there is something extra, right? That it's an, it's an order book, yes, 
but it's not just an order book or it's an order book with extra stuff or it's a, an order book with something more or an order book like you've never seen before. This is the type of thing that I'm talking about. It's an order book that is built specifically to enable traders to do the stuff that they're already doing, but in a way that is a lot, le- um, a lot more frictionless and a lot more intuitive. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm hoping that once we, um, once we're ready to start receiving an audience there, that it's going to be, um, it's going to be immediately clear to people that are already doing this kind of stuff every day, um, that this product was designed with them in mind. Thank you so much. So this is a question then that you, you're referring to it as an order book. And you're talking about like on-chain order book system versus some of these order book like systems that exist at the moment. When Carbon was first announced, it was referred to as a new AMM design. Do you see them as one in the same? Like this is, or is yeah. this more, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I do see them as one in the same. So I, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's not so clear cut. Um, certainly you wouldn't call a traditional AMM an order book, right? Something like, um, you know, Bancor V1 was not an order book. Um, you know, Uniswap V2 was not an order book. Uh, SushiSwap is, is not an order book. Um, and then you've kind of got this next generation of, of protocols, right? Like Bancor V2, right? Not V2.1, but V2 was starting to kind of look a little bit more order book like. Um, and Uniswap V3, again, is starting to look a little bit more order book like. And, um, you know, Trader Joe and so on, right? There, we're seeing a, a lot of these protocols. There's a, a really phenomenal uh, white paper that's just been made available recently um, about the, the DEX that's being built on Cardano that is extremely order book like. And so AMMs, you know, they kind of started life as being an alternative to order books so that we could have continuous on chain liquidity that it has, um, you know, unlimited liquidity at all price points. And as an industry, we kind of played around with that idea for a really long time. And what's interesting is to see that it certainly has a place in DeFi. And I think that, you know, we're we're going to have to learn how to merge these ideas um, together. But we know what the problems are with, with traditional, you know, constant product AMMs. And there is reason why these more order book like products are gaining so much traction. And it's because the active traders, right? The people that actually move volume around on blockchains, that's the kind of service, that's the kind of product that they want to interact with. So would I would I call it an AMM? I mean, yes, an AMM is still in my mind, just a, uh, a series of smart contracts that facilitates exchange of assets in a, in a decentralized manner between anonymous users. So in that sense, of course, it's still an AMM. And it still uses, you know, an invariant function um, to um, to automatically price assets along a bonding curve. So it's still an AMM in that respect. But it's, I think, the first example we have of a non-prescriptive AMM. So an AMM that says you choose the price and you choose the algorithm, um, rather than the AMM chooses it for you and you decide whether or not to participate. So is it an AMM? I mean, yes, it still has all of those features um, and all of those like major sort of core components, the same bones of an AMM, but it looks and behaves very, very differently. And so eventually, you know, it could be something of a, you know, a historical curiosity one day that someone will look back and, and sort of wonder if there was ever um, a clear line in the sand between what an exchange protocol or a trading or a liquidity book or a, um, order book looked like compared to traditional AMMs, um, because you know we've kind of gone through this process ourselves, and the difference is so clear to us, and we are struggling with you know what these def- what these words mean and and what things do and how we should communicate it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if it, you're asking my opinion, yes, it's still an AMM, um, but it is also an order book, and you don't need to make a, a distinction between these things. Awesome, thank you. You touched on this one a little bit. Um, what you had, you had stated in the Twitter space is that DeFi needs more day traders to address its liquidity needs. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit more than you kind of already did, or? Yeah, I don't sure, want to just I think. Right past it. No, 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 it's, it's, it's fine. Um, I, I probably weren't 
I won't elaborate on it too much. Um, I just wanted to, what I, what I was saying there is that the most healthy markets are the ones where stuff is being traded all the time, right? Like not just, um, you know, being huddled and then, you know, dumped all at once or liquidated in a rush and causing these, you know, cascading events through stuff. We do have liquidity problems across all of cryptocurrency. And I think the reason that we do is because we're still reliant on these kinds of, you know, um, you know, a- AMM safety nets, um, they kind of bring some sort of liquidity support to these assets. But we also know that because of how predictable they are and because of how, um, you know, how, um, how, how they are abused, I think is what I want to say, um, by people with, you know, or not even by necessarily single individuals, but by the, um, the amalgam of everyone in the industry, right? Um, when they need to, you know, to when they panic and they want to get rid of a lot of tokens, AMMs kind of become the um, the punching bag of the industry's, you know, frustration. And um, you know, it's it's liquidity providers in those protocols that end up having to, um, you know, weather a lot of that that injury. Um, I think we don't necessarily need that to be true, right? I think it would be much better. To have a system or to have a culture or infrastructure that supports people who are willingly um you know buying assets at cheap prices because that's what their strategy dictated they they should do um and where um you know if the the price of something is is quickly accelerating um that it's because people are again willingly um you know selling tokens at at, at those prices um, and that they are happy, right, to have taken profits at that range, rather than liquidity providers who are sort of um, left wondering, like, what happened to all the tokens that um, that they that they had that they didn't necessarily uh, have the ambition to sell at that range. And this is important because, you know, when I said before that I don't see that there's a clear distinction between an, an AMM and an order book, um, even though there are clear you know, differences and we can describe them differently. But an AMM is still an kind of an automatic order book. And I think a lot of people that are in DeFi and using liquidity products kind of neglected to realize that they are actively trading the tokens that they provide. And, um, you know, it's, there's only so much that you can, um, you can do to sort of raise awareness for these things. Um, I think having a an active, like, you know, um, an, an active protocol that actually gets users to declare what prices that they want to buy and sell at is just much better for the, the user experience overall, because they don't have that, that sense of being, um, manipulated, I guess, or that sense of, um, having decisions made on their behalf. And that is why the industry needs more day traders, right? It's we want people who are agreeing to buy and sell stuff at all kinds of prices all the time, keeping the the industry liquid, rather than a um, you know a, a passive liquidity base who doesn't understand what it is that they're doing exactly. And I think that that's the that's the point that I wanted to make. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Um, and it makes sense. A lot of liquidity providers don't realize that when they provide liquidity, they're agreeing to these terms and these trades that are happening, you know. Um, so being able to create those strategies on your own is, like you had said at one point, empowering for DeFi users. I want to um, give Numiasma, is that how I say it, um, the chance to ask you their questions. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Serum, Serum on the Solana chain was an order book like DEX and seemed like a good solid project. How Solana chain has weathered the recent storm with some damage. Serum, for some reason, just folded up like a house of cards due to unspecified deep connections to FTX. Are there any worries that Carbon, despite its decentralized nature, is still tied singularly to Bancor and thus might suffer the same susceptibility to failure? Also, what prevents carbon from being dominated by whales and suffering the same potential fate as our recent Celsius slash three AC apocalypse? Yeah, terrific questions. Um, so the um, the serum the serum protocol on um, on Solana is certainly um, 
like you're right, it did have again audible clack properties. Um, not um, you know, it's it still isn't offering um, the stuff that we've built into carbon, but it had some of those um, aspects to it. Um, I think that you know one of the things that um, that a, a lot of the DeFi like protocols on Solana were suffering from is the fact that they had a, a huge dependence on wrapped assets, especially wrapped Ethereum. Um, and this was like, you know, we, we've, we've seen this get played out on, on more than one occasion. So I remember, for example, during the, the wormhole hack, um, where a huge amount of, of uh, ETH was removed from, um, from the bridge. And that effectively meant that the wrapped ETH on Solana was completely uncollateralized. Um, and if it wasn't for jump trading, who came in and, and restored the ETH balance there, um, all of that wrapped ETH would, would you know, have been essentially just a, a ghost copy of the ETH that used to be in that bridge. Um, so it was, it's really, I think, Solana's dependence on wrapped assets from Ethereum um, that was kind of one of its weak spots. Um, with regards to the FTX collapse, um, this problem was further exacerbated uh, by the fact that FTX was, I think, the number one issuer of wrapped assets on, um, on Solana. Um, I think that they had like, you know, their own version of wrapped Bitcoin and, you know, other, other things. And FTX was just issuing those the same way that Circle issues wrapped Bitcoin on, on Ethereum and USDC on Ethereum. Um, and so when FTX was revealed to not um, have those things properly collateralized, um, that was certainly one of the things that didn't just shake, um, didn't just shake Serum because it's a, an order book, um, but it shook the entire DeFi infrastructure and all valuation on Solana. So it wasn't really a weakness of of Serum for being an order book, but it was a weakness of um, the economy on Solana being predicated on wrapped assets that may or may not be collateralized. Um, with respect to um, whale stuff that you're referring to. Um, in carbon or like you don't pool your assets with anyone, right? Every single liquidity provider has their, or every single trader, I think is the, the, the term I'd prefer to use from now on. Uh, but every single trader is using their own, um, you know, is using their own bonding curve. You are in a pool with no one but yourself. There is no one participating with you. Uh, you are um, you are an island of, of your own liquidity. Your order is not mixed with anyone else's. Um, there are very clear divisions between every single user. And so if a whale pulled out, you know, a whole bunch of liquidity, it wouldn't matter the same way that if, um, you know, just like, you know, coming back to my friend selling PlayStations on eBay, if, um, there was another, you know, mega store, like, I don't know, like, uh, GameStop or something. I don't know if they have an eBay store, but let's pretend that they do. If GameStop suddenly went bankrupt and pulled all of their PlayStations from eBay, would my friend have been affected? Like, does, it, does he even care whether or not they're selling PlayStations? It really doesn't matter. This actually comes back to something that I've been discussing internally, um, where um, a, a few contributors and community members have been asking, like, what is the, the sufficient liquidity for carbon to be operational? Right? Like, what would we consider to be the, um, the minimum number of orders or the minimum amount of liquidity um, before the protocol can work? Right? And the answer is any amount. Right, even if it's only got one order for one hundred dollars or something, that's enough, right? That's just the the first, um, you know, the the first listing for tokens at a certain price. Um, so it's not like a, you know, it, it doesn't function like, um, you know, other other protocols do, right? So like lending protocols have pooled assets, most AMMs have pooled assets, um, but Carbon does not pool your assets. Um, it's just uh, a standalone thing, and you are by yourself. So the actions you you are only impacted by your own actions. The actions of anyone else doesn't um, doesn't have an effect on you. Does that answer your question? I, I can't remember if there was a third thing in there. No, no third thing. Uh... I still think, though, that uh, the impact of whales has got to be felt in the market, even if we're all individuals. Um, so I'm not yeah, sure, sure what the, the particular susceptibility of carbon might be to whale, you know, giant whale movements. It's still going to move that market and can cause a panic and a bank run and, you know, those same sorts of things. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, there is no, but like, what, what would a bank run in this case look like? Right. There's no advantage to uh, being first or last out. The uh, yeah, sure. W- whales can move the market, and of course that they will. And in a way, you know, when I've um, when I watch these day traders talk about what they do, they're even counting on whales moving the market. Right. There's a, there's actually there's a YouTube channel I used to watch years ago called Skinny Moon Trader or something. I can't remember. This is a a really sweet uh, Singaporean um, gentleman. Uh, who does like the the top 50 um, coins by market cap and has a look at, you know, what the charts are doing. And he's always, he's always saying, we have to wait and see what the whales have in store, right? What the whales have planned for this token. The day traders are actually, you know, they're not, um, you know, they're not hoping that the whales don't do something. They're actually betting on what the whales are going to do. And I, I find that this is true in, in most established markets. Um, you know, it, the, the the people that are, are trading these assets regularly, um, they know about, you know, insiders and they know about manipulation and they know about, you know, they, they're under no misapprehension that the, the market is, you know, somehow self-governed. Um, they're just trying to work out what the people in control of the market have planned. And that's, you know, we're never going to escape that. Um, every aspect of our society is, you know, kind of affected by... Um, what people with with money and power um, are you know are are planning to do with that thing, um, and you know you no longer have to be um, at the the mercy you know I mean you're always at the mercy of it, um, but you don't have to agree to sell something anymore on on you know within Bancor's ecosystem if you don't want to, because you set the price, and so you know if there is a big whale movement that um, that moves the price of something down or or, or whatever. Um, and you know, if, if you've set a, an order to buy at that low price, then all that's happening is that your order is being fulfilled at your request. So if you have an order to buy ETH at say, you know, four hundred dollars, and whale moves the price to four hundred dollars, all that's going to happen is that your your order will be uh, fulfilled. Um, but when the you know, if you've got an order to sell ETH at twenty thousand dollars. Um, and a whale moves the price for twenty thousand dollars, and so be it, right? You you are kind of a passenger um, in what these you know um, these giant you know gigantic um, and immovable forces are, are are doing with you know with the valuations of stuff, and that's okay, you know. Um, Forex is the same, real estate is the same, precious metals is the same. The question is now that you've got that you know now that you're aware of these things, what uh, you know how are you going to trade? with it, right? If you have that information and you have that expectation and that conviction, um, what are you going to do with it? And so the the answer, I think, with regards to this product is to give you the capacity to act on those instincts rather than have to, um, you know, sit by passively and wait for the market to move you around. So it's, um, yeah. But yeah, I agree with you. Whales will continue to do whale things. Um, things will continue to to grow and and shrink and collapse. I'm currently watching in horror as the Reserve Bank of Australia um, is failing to increase the interest rate. And you know, I'm I'm going to watch our you know economy um, continue to to inflate, or our sorry, our dollar continue to inflate while the economy continues to spiral down, um, and just delay you know the inevitable housing crash that I'm I'm expecting to happen with you know slowly but horribly over the next few years. And in a way, it's the Australian government that's the whale in that case. So, you know, I, I, it's, it, I'm not entirely sure what, um, what we can do as, as builders to try and prevent that. But um, what I can tell you is that there is some interesting um, capabilities in carbon um, that can be used for things like inventory liquidation. So one of, the, one of the most common whale games is to deliberately try and liquidate someone. And the, the reason for this is often not well understood um, but we can explore it a little bit because i think that speaking about how carbon can uh, can address some of these problems might actually be worth hearing when you're attempting to liquidate someone uh, it generally means that you know they've they've taken a loan against some volatile asset usually into a stable coin um, and as long as the the value of the the collateral that they've left behind is over some threshold um, that loan is still good but as soon as it becomes, you know, close to the value that they've borrowed, then the lending protocol will um, confiscate the collateral that they've provided and have to sell it on the open market um, to try and recover the the funds that they borrowed. 
Um, the problem here is that when liquidations are occurring, it is necessarily using the existing liquidity um, in order to facilitate um, that liquidation. And so we've already seen, and again, on Solana, this was a big problem um, because there were some loans that were so large um, that to liquidate it would have been impossible, right? That would have driven the, the price of some of the, the, the tokens provided as collateral to near zero. Uh, we've seen this just recently as well. I think last week, Avi was playing a game with um, the, uh, the Curve founders um, who have a, a very large loan against CRV. And apparently he noticed that if he could drive the price on CRB down a little bit, that um, he might be able to liquidate that position. Now, if you know that you can do that, right, if you can force the price down and force a token into liquidation, and you can see how much collateral is there and how little liquidity there is for it, um, then, you can, um, then you can anticipate um, how far down the price of that token is likely to go. And we've seen this, right? We've, we've seen these liquidation cascades end up with um, you know, 40 to 50% drawdowns, even more than that. I remember um, when Ichi um, had this problem with Rari Fuse, and we saw the Ichi token capitulate down dramatically, right? These, these problems partly um, arise from the fact that you have nowhere else to go than to take the tokens that are provided as collateral and just dump them on a liquidity pool. And if you move the price very, very quickly, then a lot of the people that are forcing that token into liquidation have an opportunity to short that token beforehand. And this is precisely why these kinds of things, why people are incentivized to do these kinds of things. Um, this may also, by the way, um, be the um, underpinning reason behind the Terra Luna um, collapse. Um, it looks like, uh, I can't remember the, the rumors precisely, and I never got to the bottom of it. I stopped paying attention after a little while, honestly. But one of the um, narratives that was developing there, that it was someone at Citadel who waited for Do Kwon to move a lot of the UST liquidity out of Curve in preparation for the four pool that he was preparing with Rari. And it was when that liquidity went thin that they um, executed their short on UST and, and depegged the token. So it's not a, you know, it, these things aren't, you know, um, conspiracy theories or something, right? This is a, a very well-known and very profitable strategy. And it is essentially supported by illiquidity, right? This is why uh, liquidity is, is so important and why, you know, these the reason why these, liquid these liquidation cascades occur at all is because of liquidity issues. And with an order book system like ours, because you can contribute liquidity at, at any point, right, at any price you want, imagine a lending protocol who needs to, um, needs to recover, let's say, 100,000 DAI with, I don't know, a certain amount of ETH that has been provided as collateral. On Carbon, you can set the price so that exactly 100,000 DAI will be returned to you for fulfilling the order on ETH. And this is very, very different to dumping ETH on the open market in order to try and recover that DAI. Um, it's also very, very different to opening it up to auction for, um, for liquidators to fulfill um, because they are still, you know, they're just intermediaries. They're still using things like flash loans and whatever to try and, um, and, and move that, that collateral into um, AMMs or whatever other liquidity sources they can find um, to try and repay the, the flash loan and keep whatever the balance is at the end. So it's still keeping liquidity thin on the ground. You're basically stressing what little liquidity DeFi already has in order to try and liquidate some of these loans. Um, Hello. On Carbon, oh, I'll, I'll finish this point really quickly. Imagine a system where instead of um, trying to force uh, tokens out of liquidity pools by, by trading into them, instead creating a, um, a limit order or a, you know, a, an, a, an order, whatever we want to call it, on carbon that says you can have all of this E for exactly 100,000 die, right? Who wouldn't take that deal if it was below market price? And this means that the people that are taking that ETH, if they wanted to, right, they could for sure arbitrage it into other liquidity protocols or whatever. But a lot of people would just be happy to buy ETH at a low price. And it's, this is the difference between maker and taker liquidity, is that the, the taker orders are constantly stressing the underlying maker orders. 
And they have to, because, you know, if you're liquidating a loan, you've got no choice. You can't just go to Uniswap and say, you know, I'm going to try and create liquidity with this, hoping that people buy it for me because I need to close that loan. But on Carbon, you actually can do that. You can you can say, I'm happy to sell this ETH at a 20% discount to whoever takes it, so long as I get exactly the $100,000 back that this person loaned. And that could actually prevent these kinds of liquidation cascades that, we've, that have been, you know, really plaguing the industry for a really long time. And just with those anecdotes that I've already provided on this, you know, um, in this rant, I'm sorry, but Terra Luna, Itchy, the Avi stuff that was trying to happen with uh, with Curve recently, th these are, you know, this is like an ongoing plague, right? We've never really got out of it. And if AMMs were the, you know, if, if these continuous pricing uh, liquidity models were supposed to rescue us from that, then why haven't they done it yet? I think that it's time to um, to consider a different approach. And if a, a, a normal limit order system is not the way to do it, then maybe the type of flexibility that we offer with carbon might actually get us a little step closer to it. So that's, I think, all I have to say about that. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I would think that that answered your question, Numiasma. So I'm going to, if you have another one, I'm gonna come back to you. We have another community member who joined us, so I'm going to go ahead and unmute if you want to go ahead and ask Mark your question. Um, perfect. So then, Mark, you brought up a couple of different things. One was um, things that Carbon can do, right? And something that we had touched on with the Twitter spaces was a token launcher. Maybe you can speak to that because that was a question that came in directly from a community member. If this is something that Bancor might be um, planning for in the future, something that Carbon can do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it can do it. Um, there is, uh, this is obviously not a new concept. Um, I think Copper Protocol um, is a really great case study. We've built some, um, some highly, um, you know, competent and effective token launching platforms on top of Balancer. Um, and in a way, Balancer is really well suited to this because of the the variable weights that they have on their bonding curves um, that can allow for you know a specific kind of profile to be adhered to during the token launch um and you know launching a token for the first time is kind of weird because it's not really in the hands of many people the market doesn't really have a chance to establish um a voice um in the the short length of time that you're that you're distributing it and more often than not, um, you know, a lot of these teams will take whatever money that they raise um, when the, the token is after the token's launched and just kind of disappear with it. Um, there was a, a recent a recent study from um, Nokia Bell Labs that um, that actually did a, a full analysis on what they called rug pulls um, for token launches on Uniswap V2, I think. And it was an overwhelming majority. It was like in the 90% something, right? I think it was even, it, was, it might have been even in the high 90%. Um, so token launching is clearly problematic, right? It, it has issues. Copper protocol is pretty good, right? They, they have um, gone a long way to, um, I think, addressing some of those problems. Um, but I still think that there's room to, um, to contribute to that sort of developing infrastructure. Um, it's also worth pointing out that um, SushiSwap had a token launching platform and it wasn't by any means a bad one um, but it, it didn't really get a lot of traction and I'm not entirely sure why that is um, but that's certainly something that should be um, you know considered you know if there is a, a real appetite for launching legitimate tokens um, in a decentralized way and you know providing those early um, adopters of a token some sort of assurance that the the funds that are being raised are going to be used for legitimate, um, you know, project building purposes. Um, if all of that is true, then I might have expected um, Sushi's uh, Sushi's token launcher to be a little bit more popular than it was. Um, and so, the, you know, that is worth considering. So whether or not you know this is something that the DAO expects to see or wants to see, I think is going to be an ongoing discussion. But what I will say um, is that the the first time that I had the um, the carbon equations in my hand, 
um, one of the first things that I did with it was demonstrate a token launcher. And the, the reasoning behind it was that if I, if I personally was to participate in a, in, a, in a token launch, there are certain things that I would expect to see. And one is some kind of schedule about how price discovery for a token might look. Um, one of the frustrations that I've heard from around the industry, and we've got a lot of, you know, I have a lot of um, co uh, colleagues in, in other protocols that have used things like Copper Protocol, um, and they tend to follow this kind of Dutch auction scheme, um, which means that the, the price of the token is actually constantly falling until they're all bought. Um, and a lot of people sort of, I think, stumble into these kinds of auctions, not really understanding how it works. And so, you know, don't understand why after they've bought a token or if people are continuously buying a token, why its price continues to go down. Um, and so that kind of behavior um, is, is certainly something that would keep me from participating in a token launch of that type. What I would have preferred is a, a token that launches at a stable price, right? Where um, it's predictable um, whether or not I can buy and sell more of these tokens or you know, get a refund for the tokens that I, that I purchased for a certain length of time, for example. And so we can do that because the, the carbon equations allow for what's called constant pricing. One of the things that uh, we have got a parameter in the, um, in the equation um, that, that allows the, the curve to be infinitely magnified. And so this means you end up with zero slippage. And that also means zero price discovery which is not so bad um, if you are you know, pre-advertising that you're going to have this token launch and that this is, the, uh, you know, this is going to be what a token sells for in the beginning. Um, not such a bad deal. But then you can't have constant pricing forever um, because you know, the reason why people are going to be speculating on, on, on stuff is generally because they expect it to appreciate in value or, or you know, they we may want to exit from this thing later or buy more of something and so on. And you, eventually you need um, regular market forces um, to, to sort of, you know, take, take sway over, um, you know, how, how a token is, is, is priced right, and what its value is. And so on carbon, one of the things we can do is slowly dial back the um, liquidity amplification from infinity um, down to something like, you know, um, you know, like a, a 2x amplification or even a 1x um, and bring it all the way back to constant product. And this is interesting because you can actually tell people ahead of time, you know, this is how slippage is, is likely to, um, to impact, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the ability to trade this token in the, in the near future on this schedule. So if you're an early adopter and like on day one of this token launch, if you buy a whole bunch of tokens and you want to get rid of them because you get cold feet, you can get them all back without having to, like without the risk of anyone front running you or rugging it or something like that. Um, but the, you know, if you have the conviction that the project is going to do well and you're, you know, impressed with the team and so on, um, that the, uh, the tokens um, price discovery can slowly be dialed in, right? So that, over time, the market can kind of make up its mind about what it's worth um, as it becomes established, then I think that that actually sounds like a much better idea than trying to rush it all and, you know, launch everything on constant product from day one. So there are elements to this that, I'm, you know, I have previously modeled carbon on top of, and I think that we can and should have these discussions. Um, but um, I think that it's something that we can sort of give ourselves a little bit of breathing room for. I'm not sure how much the how much appetite the market has right now for for new projects. Um, but you know the 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 industry will recover, right? We know that you know crypto Armageddon happens every few years. So um, I'm fully convinced that um, that everything will go back to normal. And during the next um, spike in in um, in engagement and and user adoption and so on that there will be more projects that are launching their tokens and and um, that will be looking for uh, ways to um, to delineate themselves from the the type of rug pull scams that were so prominent on Uniswap v2 for example and I think carbon is a good way to do it and uh, if anyone wants to see that you know that PowerPoint that I prepared that 
demonstrated how this could be done, um, please reach out to Jen and I, I can, I'm happy for, for her to share it with you. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. So maybe not right away, considering the you know state of the market right now or the industry, but in the future, it's definitely a possibility. Um, okay, so we're coming up on an hour. One of the most commonly asked questions that I have noticed is, you know, you know what? Hold on. Papa Shango was requesting to speak and finally was able to join us up on stage. So before I ask my question, I want to pass the floor over. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Can you guys? Well, thanks. Hey. Good, good. Um, so I just recently um, like found out about all this stuff with um, you know the V three, uh, how uh, the pools got all messed up and everything um, due to the yeah. loss of the you know protocol. Um, so my question was um, because I, I have a bunch of link in V three in that pool, and um, I've been asking a lot of questions in the Discord the past couple of days, and what I was kind of told was that in order for my original link deposit um, to come back to what it was, because right now it's probably about like 40, 50% down, that the price of B&T would need to, or, or, or not, not the price of B&T, but the performance of B&T would need to outweigh that of link. So I would guess like, um, you know, if link goes up 5x, you know, next bull run or whatever, BNT would need to go up like 10x um, in order for this pool to balance out again. And with carbon, right. I'm I'm aware that, um, you know, the fees from um, BNT, uh, it will go towards restoring these pools. Um, so I'm just wondering, like, realistically, um how that will work exactly with like restoring these pools. Um, because I mean, me personally, I think link has more of a shot to outperform. Um, B I can speak to this one a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm just wondering, you know, like how that would work if link yeah. outperforms B and T, then how are these pools going to be restored in that sense? So we can't really speak to any sort of price action. Like that's just muddy okay. waters that you don't want to go there. But what I will say is I don't, I don't, I didn't see you um, when I first started the call, but I had posted something on the Bancor governance um, on discourse. And I was basically just, I'm, I'm addressing the DAO and the community and the, the LPs, everybody who's on V2.1, V3, interested in carbon. Um, about the state of the protocol and how I personally am hoping to see the fees from carbon be applied towards, you know, helping alleviate the deficit. You uh, can't say for sure that they are because it's a DAO decision that, you know, the, oh, DAO okay. controls, the DAO controls all of these things. But as a member of the DAO, like I, I definitely show my support for this. I, I'm not only a member of the DAO, but I'm an LP on V3 as well. You know, mm -hmm. a link LP, as a matter of fact. So we're we're in the same boat here. But, yeah. um, you know, I and Mark, you can address this as well. I just kind of wanted to jump in because this what I had posted on governance was so fresh. And I know that that's a big concern. And so then there was some confusion, you know, like, how does carbon relate to Bancor? And, and how is this going to help alleviate the deficit? And the entire goal behind all of this is to help alleviate the deficit. And it's just now a matter of getting this product out there, you know, presenting these things, you know, within the DAO, the DAO presenting these things and, and voting for these fees to be applied to alleviating that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. So I think, yeah, a lot of the stuff that Jen said, I couldn't have said better myself. Um, I will say is that I'm in the same boat as Jen is, right? And my, my link is also in V3. And um, so I'm suffering with everyone else. Um, it's, and you know, when I, when I say things like, um, you know, that carbon was designed specifically to create a, um, an augmented, you know, revenue stream, something that is successful enough and, um, you know, has the potential to be popular enough and used enough that, um, it can just simply buy, um, you know, or pay down that, that deficit, um, I mean that not in the sense that I'm like white knighting for the protocol or something, right? I'm I'm also selfishly wanting um, you know the carbon to to be successful enough to do that because my own um, you know non BNT tokens are are in the protocols with with everyone else's. Um, 
but you are right that the um the the uh you know the, there is this kind of um like price um you know the, the this price disparity or this price parity um on each of the pools that needs to be taken into account um and you know what i you know i i, I it's difficult for me to have that conversation, especially in an open um, forum like this one, because it might be construed or misconstrued as me, you know, saying that I have a, a particular price expectation for Link or for BNT, and that that's something that I cannot do. But what I can say is that um, we're not necessarily limited to those kinds of mechanics. Um, you know, V3 was developed to, you know, it, it has utility in it. It's not just a regular, you know, constant product AMM. It has the ability to move tokens on and off curve. And this means that you can actually take advantage of day-to-day -day volatility um, in order to sort of secure uh, link tokens as they're being reaccumulated inside the protocol. And so this is something that I think that, you know, we need to, um, you know, we need to explore more uh you know we need to explore more thoroughly with the DAO, um and i think that it was important to have a um you know a, a functioning product right something that we can all rally behind and, and believe in and that is successful and makes sense and that is addressing a market need first um before we start looking at these um you know these mechanics because it's still in some way um and I, I don't think that this is you know controversial it's still predicated on you know the success of the protocol overall and so if you know the the impermanent loss protection paradigm was not enough right to um you know to 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 garner that kind of traction, um, then I'm hoping this limit order based system, or I'm, I'm actually convinced that this limit order based system and the types of sophisticated players and volume and um, and um, flexibility that it brings to the industry is is going to to be that thing that we're looking for. So the 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 point that I'm trying to make is you're not wrong, right? The the thing that you've been told about the the price and things, it's it that's not like I'm not going to say I'm not going to call that out and say well that's a misunderstanding because it's not, but it's not the complete picture, right? The, we have all of these other dials and levers that we can we can use on V3 so that we're not beholden just to um, the price action of the two tokens. And in a way, um, Almanac is um, you know exploring some of that already um, by making uh, recommendations to things like fees and, um, and on and off curve liquidity to try and address that specific issue. And so if you're interested, um, I would suggest having a look at some of the reports that they've written um, and they're going to improve over time. Um, but I think, you know, it might be, um, time as well and sometime in the near future to bring Almanac back and, and get them to, um, to talk about, um, you know, what they've learned about how these mechanisms work and, and things like that. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's more complex than what you've been told, but what you've been told is also not, um, you know, is, is not inaccurate. Gotcha. So in, in when you're saying there's like more things, um, like then carbon, um, is that like when they're, uh, is, I think I heard you saying you'll be buying back B and T through the protocol and, um, and then does it get burned? So will that make the price of B and T in essence go up and that would help it's offset not, that pool a little bit? It's not necessarily about price. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, like, uh, essentially, um, during the, the catastrophe when, um, when Celsius, um, you know, withdrew uh, the majority of the ETH out of the protocol. Um, this did cause a an inflationary spike in BNT, and that's kind of the the beginning of the the end of of that paradigm. Um, and so there does need to be a, a kind of cleanup, right? And this is um, you know one of the things that that we need to do. Um, the DAO was actually very very quick to 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 begin um, that cleanup process um, immediately afterwards. And so this is why the, the vortex rate is set at what it is. And we've even moved away from burning BBNT directly um, to burning BNT, which is, uh, I think, um, you know, proven uh, to be a positive change. But I, this is still an open discussion. I don't want to um, opine too much on that. Um, but with carbon, the point is, is that if you want to fix the deficit, you need, you know, the, the protocol needs to have money to do that. 
And at the moment, it's not really selling anything, right? It's kind of humming mm. along and it's still vacuuming up this BNT, which is, which is great because we need to reduce, um, you know, we need to undo some of the damage that was done in June. Um, and carbon, in a way, is a, a way to accelerate that. Um, but it's not only that, right? You just yep. you need, you know, the protocol needs money to, to, to fix this. And we're trying to develop a product that is, has the potential to earn money very quickly. Um, and then things like these deficits won't be so big of a problem. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, thank you so much, by the way, for, I, I know it's a super stressful thing and for being so polite, I really, I really appreciate the way that you, um, that you conducted yourself. So thank you so yeah. much. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Seconded. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dark Knight, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Testing, testing. You are good. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you guys for having these types of open discussions. Uh, number one, I think, you know, I'm, I'm similarly in a situation with Papa Shango, except I decided to stay in V2 just mainly because it was very difficult to understand the ramifications and consequences of to migrate to V3 or not to migrate to V3 and the copious amount of documentation, the copious amounts of things that you kind of need to get spun up on if you're not in this day to day the way you guys are. Um, so these type of discussions, I think, are a great way to help facilitate that. Um, you know, so just as like a little bit of a preamble, uh, definitely thank you. Uh, we, I think we should have more of these, um, you know, whether they be weekly or biweekly little discussions where we can just talk about, you know, Bancor itself and those of us who may not necessarily be in it can like kind of get caught up to speed uh, without just, you know, the reading is important. I'm not saying that clearly we shouldn't, but just it the context of understanding the like the heaviness or how important things are, I think that's what was kind of like lost in translation to all this. So while you guys were clearly trying to put out a fire, um, you know, those of us who were not in this situation couldn't really even understand, um, you know, kind of what's going on, right? So like I said, I just, I, I, I sincerely appreciate having these type of discussions um, and, you know, I, I, I said something into Glenn in the group about like maybe what we could do moving forward of having these, maybe even having like a monthly video summary of like these recordings with just like some brief minutes and people can like re-listen to them. I know you guys are on I Twitter. I saw that. You know I don't want to interrupt you, but I saw that. Yeah. And I really appreciate your suggestions. Um, I'm actually going to go back once we end this call and kind of make note of what it is that you, you know, are suggesting and, and kind of requesting from me or, or you know from us here on this end of it but um in Whoa. you Me know the, the minutes the minutes kind of like we did with the twitter spaces that we had hosted last week like the the plan is once we're done with the dow discussion to do something along the same lines so some of these things are already in the works and now that we're kind of getting back into the groove of you know hosting these DAO discussions and and hosting the Twitter Spaces and and having this constant you know sort of communication and and I agree with you the the verbalizing everything that underlying tone of certain things it is important and and as much as you appreciate you know us having this like I appreciate you joining and actually like participating in this. No, definitely. Yeah, and you're absolutely message received by the way. Like uh, I think our content production it does need to have like a lot more variety. Um, I'm I'm generally not a good a good person for sort of, um, you know, producing content that is appropriate for consumption by like a mass market, right? The things that I, I tend to produce are, are pretty technical, very dry. And as you pointed out, you know, uh, you know, prohibitively long. It's something that I'm criticized for, but I also like to make sure that there is exhaustive um, and thorough documentation for everything that we do. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I don't see the value in having things that are um, more concise. You know, I, 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 I fully appreciate that and I can see that I'm not the right person for it. Um, and, you know, I'm very lucky to have a, a bunch of very talented uh, colleagues and, uh, you know, uh, the other contributors in, in Bancor are um, very dedicated to producing that kind of content and making sure that it's easily digestible. So we will be taking that um, comment to heart. 
I, I promise. And you, you should expect to see a lot more of that kind of content that's a lot less daunting, a lot less confronting, a lot less, you know, formidable than the the kind of things yeah. that I've been posting to uh to discourse. So yeah, I, I appreciate the comment and I, I assure you we'll take it to heart. No, definitely appreciate it, guys, on, on, on that note. So like I said, that was my little preamble. Uh, my question, though, I guess now, since Papa Shango asked is about v, V3, like I said, I decided to stay in the V2, right? And granted, it was mainly because I was, I was concerned about the fears of if I migrated to V3 and contextually maybe there was some other functional vulnerability that I could not in-depth understand, um, that maybe I'd be beholden to whatever that is. So not being able to understand the the, the consequences and the risks uh, now has me in a situation where maybe I would have migrated to V3, you know, n maybe understanding what Carbon would be doing for V3. So as far as V2 goes and those of us who may be like liquidity providers. Oh, from oh go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah, let me clarify. Like, I... Um you know the i consider i guess i used v3 as kind of a catch-all term um what i what i should say is the legacy protocol um and so if you've if you've chosen to remain on v2.1 don't don't worry um the you know the um the the way that the the deficit will be addressed will will need to necessarily be spread over both v2.1 and v3 so if you've chosen not to migrate um, it's, it's like, don't feel like you've missed the bus or something. That's absolutely like, we wouldn't do that. Um, the, you know, whatever success we, we garner for, for carbon, um, and as, uh, you know, however long that takes or, you know, whatever needs to be done to, to, to realize that goal, um, rest assured that if you, if you're in V2.1, you'll still reap the benefit. You don't have to migrate to V3 for that, for that purpose. So, um, I hope that that, um, brings some, some relief. It for sure does, because for a moment, <laughs> it just seemed like in so many words, I was fucked, but... <laughs> no, um, I'm so sorry that I gave you that impression. I'm realizing now that I need to be very careful um, when referring to V2.1 and V3. But no, you, you're you're fine. Uh, we, we, you know, it, it would be ethically and morally apprehensive if we only benefited the people that migrated to V3. So don't worry. Um, you, you, everyone who's in the legacy protocol is is in it together, and Carbon is meant to be here to benefit all of us. So uh, don't worry, you you'll be fine. Understood, and thank you guys. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Okay, Mark. I think um, with all of that being said, you know everybody keeps asking about a, a time frame. I know we don't necessarily want to do time frame, uh -huh. but you gave us. I I know. I know. <laughs> I know this, but um, somebody had asked you know, before the Twitter spaces had started. And I, I appreciated the way that it was worded. You know, is this in production phase? Is this in the, you know, is it still being designed phase? Maybe we could just end on that note. You could just give everybody a little bit of an update on where it actually stands at the moment. Not not any sort of an estimated launch day or anything of that sort. Okay, good, because I'm, I'm not gonna do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the current state of things is that, um, so, you know, the, the contracts for, um, for this idea were, were already well underway, um, before we, um, you know, started discussing it. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons, right. And I don't want to think that, that, you know, that, the, you know, that these kinds of decisions are being made without our involvement, cause that's not the case. It's really, it's a part of the, the research and development phase. Well, after you've got something, um, you know, some idea or, you know, a handful of, of you know, new mathematics and, and geometry, uh, that doesn't necessarily a, a smart contract make. You know, you, you need to um, you need to really test these ideas. And, you know, I've said before on Twitter spaces, on community calls and things that I kind of have this um, this kind of what I think many people who have worked with me, both in, in, you know, blockchain, but also in, you know, when I was a chemistry researcher, is that I tend to keep everything like really close um, until uh, I'm convinced that it's ready to be discussed. Um, and in this case, that means having, um, having, the uh, the assurance, right? Having already invested some time exploring smart contract implementation, because if we started discussing these ideas 
openly and then have to backpedal later because you know it's impossible to to execute in a smart contract context then it would just be devastating so before the white paper before the light paper before carbon had a name and so on um the smart contract developers were already um working on um you know how to how to realize these these features um and you know and and make it compatible with the EVM. So it's been, it's really, it's been a, in a some state of, of active development, um, I would say since sort of June and July. So, well, maybe that's a, a bit early, sort of, a, yeah, end of July, I would say. So it's already been, you know, um, you know, uh, tested and, you know, certain things of, you know, all of the normal stuff that you do when you're, when you're engineering something for the first time from scratch. Um, and so it was only after the we got to the point where we were convinced that yes, this is something that can be done, and there were some huge, you know, um, huge hurdles that I think we, if we weren't the the first, um, you know, smart contract developers to encounter, um, then certainly we we belong to um, a very small collection. Um, but when you give users this kind of flexibility, when you when you afford them the the agency to choose their prices, you know their token amounts, and have it be not a part of some gigantic liquidity pool, but for each user to be their own individual, like you know, uh, trader, right? To have their own specific order book profile and their own specific position and executing their own strategy. Um, that kind of complexity has to be abstracted away into something. And this means that things like um, like auto matching and, and routing through the AMM is a lot more complicated in something like Carbon um, than it is on a traditional AMM. And so those kinds of problems, we really needed to, to sink our teeth into them and make sure that it wasn't an insurmountable obstacle before we were presenting this stuff. So by the time the rest of the world found out that that you know what it was that we were that uh, was being worked on um we had already sort of gone through the motions of of creating um like you know the the first drafts of the smart contracts and and seeing if um, we can achieve the type of behavior that we wanted so it's really pretty long in the tooth at this stage um there are smart contracts already um that uh that you know that, that, that do what we want them to do. Um, it's really in the phase now of working out, um, you know, essentially ironing everything out and making sure that it's as, is as efficient as it can be. Um, obviously, we need to get into code audits and that kind of thing um, and work out what the UI um, is going to, to look like and how that's going to behave. Um, but also, you know, connecting with other people in the industry and making sure that they understand what these smart contracts do and how to use them. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, uh, spectators in, in, in DeFi don't often see, right? Which is when, by the time a protocol goes live, um, you really want to make sure that some of the, um, you know, some of the, the more organized um, influences in, in DeFi know what it is and, 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 you know, how to interact with it. And that takes time. Often they want to create their own smart contract layer on top of it and, and things like that. So it's not even that, you know, uh, we're at the stage where um, we've got our own smart contracts ready, but we've already started speaking with, um, you know, other, um, uh, other uh, you know, uh, other residents in um in the DeFi space um that may want to um you know build their own um you know build their own interaction layer on top of it so yeah it, it's pretty um it, it, it's well and truly underway um i would say that we're, we're way past the halfway mark now and we're in that um that kind of detail oriented phase where where it's starting to wonder what the app is going to look like and you know what needs to be done um to make it the the most intuitive and um an enjoyable experience for for everyone that wants to interact with it so yeah it's yeah again no deadlines um there's always unexpected problems and, and other things that show up um you know auditors often find things that that you you didn't expect and um, and all of that. So I, I'm not committing to a deadline, but uh, I, I would say that the in terms of development process, the, the the longest and hardest part of it is already behind us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to everybody who joined us. Um, dark night, like I said. I'm... Oh, I'm sorry. Go, Go ahead. ahead. 
Mark, you're good for one more? Yeah, of course. It's not too hard, okay. I don't Plus, first, just a few comments. I'd also like to volunteer that I am a link LP and B3 and will patiently and politely wait for some eventual resolution. I believe that we can, however, slowly climb out of this hole once the uh, bear market starts to ebb. Uh, if carbon truly has the resilience and flexibility that Mark has described, uh, we may want to de-emphasize the ILP uh, kind of moral high ground or financial high ground and redirect our marketing message at the right time to championing these new advantages. Although I do wonder with right. something this complicated, how expensive will this smart contract be? Because that was a real problem in, you know, V2, which was kind of. Yeah, for sure. Three. No, I can actually uh, speak. I can. Just, oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Uh, just got one little. The, my real question, though, is besides liquidity problems, market manipulations and hacks, another common protocol vulnerability is an overdependence on the protocol's own token as the entire reserve value of their own system. Does it make sense to suggest that Bancor at some point diversify its holdings to prevent this possible point of failure and reassure LPs in the market at large of Bancor's long-term stability? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it's an extremely astute observation. I, I, I agree with you um, wholeheartedly. Um, so carbon is going to be, um, you know, be, because of the the flexibility that it offers, uh, it, it doesn't really make sense, um, especially with the um, the audience that we're hoping that it finds to insist that um, that BNT um, is, um, you know, forever a part of every single pair. So that's no longer a requirement in carbon. You can create orders with any token that you want. Um, so if you want to do like a, you know, uh, ETH, die or eth usdc or usdc die or, or whatever and you know these kinds of like token pairs is actually one of the more interesting use cases that i see for the system um i expect to see many sort of uh you know um like eth wrapped eth pairs and and so on um and yeah with with that in mind um the the protocol fees are, are collected um exclusively in the the tokens that are being made and traded so um, in that sense, the protocol should collect a, a pretty uh, diversified repertoire of different assets, and um, it'll be up to the the DAO to decide how those things are used. Um, like I said um, earlier in this presentation, obviously um, alleviating the the deficits on on V two point one and V three are are paramount, right? They, there's absolutely no question in in my mind, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone um, in our DAO that that doesn't see that as a, the most urgent priority use of those those funds. Um, but after that, um, you know th this could be um, you know this could persist as a, a type of um, you know treasury system that is composed of literally every token that's traded across the protocol. Um, and in that sense, I, I think it should become a little bit more anti fragile. Um, it's definitely, um, yeah, it, it's a criticism that everyone on this call should um, should really take to heart. Um, we've seen it again and again, um, and, you know, Bancor included, the um, the sensitivity that you have to your own tokens uh, valuation um, is, is, you know, um, yeah, it, it can be your Achilles heel. And um, I, I think that a lot of protocols learn that the hard way, us included. Um, I wanted to speak to the uh, the gas efficiency thing that you spoke about before. And for anyone that's um, you know smart contract aware, um, some of the things that I'm going to say right now are are going to be um, you know very helpful. Um, if you're not very smart contract aware, you know you, you can tune out for a, a little bit if you want. This is a little bit technical. Um, but essentially, the the strategy um, creation mechanism, the the way that that contract works, it's effect it's only three slots um on the like on the evm and during a trade you only need to update one or two of them and so in terms of gas efficiency i think we're looking at i, I can't remember the exact estimates and i'm really I, I i'm not going to give a um an estimate now because uh you know i i risk saying the wrong thing and it's now 6 30 in the morning i've been up all night and i i'm i'm worried that i'll recall the the wrong number but it was very, very, very low. Um, in terms of strategy creation, um, you know, it, it's it's nothing compared to um, some of these other protocols because you're no longer interacting with um, the, you know, um, some other amalgam of smart contracts that need to update a whole bunch of variables across a bunch of different um, contracts. Um, but in our system, you really are just writing, um, you know, uh, three or four variables in, across a couple of different slots. And it's really pretty 
cost effective um, for trading. Um, it really depends on how your trade um, should be processed or what kinds of trades we're thinking should be processed. Um, if you're only interacting with like uh, one or two positions or something, it's it's likely to be, I think, um, you know, one of the more gas efficient trading options on Ethereum. Um, because there is no like um, there is no time weighted average or anything that needs to be updated because there's just no need for one, um, and there is no um, you know uh, there is no need to update a whole bunch of different variables only the the variables of the positions that you've interacted with. So if you're choosing specific positions to trade against, um, then you can do so in a way that only updates one variable and you'll only pay a handful of gas, which is really nice. Um, if you are trading, um, you know, uh, if you're basically requesting a quote for a certain number of tokens that you want to trade rather than uh, seeking out specific orders to, to accept or not accept, then um, the, the matching logic that I think that we've kind of settled on, and there's other ways that we can, we can do it, but we can either limit the number of positions that you're interacting with to a certain number, say 10. Um, and this would be very, very similar to Uniswap's um, implementation where they limit the, the number of ticks that you can cross in a single trade, I think, to six. Um, and so in terms of, yeah, in, in terms of the, the gas adjusted price of interacting with the, the protocol and, and taking one of these positions, um, it's actually like the, the, the benchmark that I'm setting is that it should be equal to or less than interacting with the Uniswap V3. Certainly in terms of strategy creation, I think it's going to be a lot less. So as, a, um, as someone who's creating orders, um, it should be very, very cheap. Let's turn it some, uh, as a taker, it can be ridiculously cheap if you're only interacting with one position. But if you have to interact with many, then that's, um, that's something else that we'll need to carefully consider. Um, but I think that this kind of system is going to be much better suited to um, specific order interactions anyway. Um, so we'll have to wait and see as the thing develops. As um, as the the routing and matching logic develops over time, so obviously we've we've fixed a lot of these things already and we've got a, a working prototype, um, but it's by no means complete, right? This is something I want to keep researching and keep iterating on to, to make it better and better. Um, but yeah, the, the gas overheads in general um, are looking... Uh, significantly better than they ever have, precisely because the you know the simplicity of the the order system is actually um, is actually pretty good, right? There, there's nothing really to exploit um, in terms of you know the normal shenanigans that people play against AMMs. So you know things like um, you know throwing the TWAP price um, by you know conducting very very large trades in one direction or the other direction. Um, in order to to force liquidations and that kind of thing, or you know, affect someone's liquidity provision or front run someone else's trade, all of these kinds of protections and considerations that you need to build into an AMM just don't apply here. Um, so even things like sandwich attacks, right, won't work on carbon because of the the way that the the um, asymmetric uh, liquidity works. So you know, it kind of by design, right? We've we put in the the extra work to make sure that the the equations by themselves, um, you know, perform a lot of that extra work, so that we don't need to add a, a huge amount of additional um, uh, like logic and things on top of the um, the smart contracts in order to facilitate that type of behavior. So let's wait and see, right? I, I'm still very very optimistic. I think that you'll be pleasantly surprised how lightweight um, these interactions are going to be. Great. Thank you, Mark. Numi Asma, I'm thinking that answered your question. Am I right? Or do you have? I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Well, I was a little off in my hour estimate here. So I just want to thank everybody for sticking around for the 90 minutes that we've been here and um, definitely looking to schedule some more of these, get them on the events calendar. So, you know, if if that happens, when that happens, I should say, we'll put an announcement in the socials and you can see it as a scheduled event here in Discord. And any other questions, please like, don't be shy. You can post them in any of our social channels or um, even message me uh, directly because I do like to keep track of those or we like to keep track of those and, and kind of reiterate a little bit what the answer is and bring clarity. If it's unclear to one, it could be unclear to others. So. Um, Again, thank you everybody. Thank you, Mark, for doing this with us and we will um, see you all soon. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Jen.